Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining the this evening. We've got a great stream with some returning guests that I think you guys are really going to enjoy. I've got kind of my cultural dream team here. You know, we got the art, we've got the cultural critique. They're uh, down to help me talk about some TV shows that started out kind of based, but ended up going woke and kind of talking about this phenomena of the woke Trojan horse in entertainment. So joining me today, I have Last Things. Thanks for joining me, man. Pleasure to be here, Oren. And then, of course, I've got Geo from Content Minded. Thanks for joining me. And Digital Archipelago, which is tomorrow on Prude's channel, too. So. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. All Both gentlemen have YouTube channels that you absolutely must check out, and they'll make sure to tell you all about those as we kind of wrap things out or up, but make sure that you're checking their stuff out. All right. So let's jump right into this. Now, Last Things gave me this idea, and I thought it was a great one, which is why I had to enlist these gentlemen for this talk. Uh, he was telling me about this idea of the woke Trojan horse. Of course, we all know about woke television. It's very clear that this stuff is everywhere. We've got the, or as we used to call it, the SJWs, uh, you know, running the entertainment uh, these days. You can't get away from it. It's in every book. It's in every TV show. It's in every video game. It's in every movie. However, that's not the only way this happens. There are these, you know, little things that Hollywood likes to throw out there. These, these glimmers of hope, these shows that start off with kind of a based premise. They've got some things that we like. They look like they might be old school. Now, and it might even be communicating a message that we agree with but over time we slowly see that these things morph and change last things can you tell us a little bit about the woke trojan horse and why you thought of some of the tv shows that we're going to talk about today yeah yeah i'd i'd, I'd be happy to Oren. and you know woke tro woke tro trojan horse i guess that's kind of my my working term for this um this phenomenon and i'm i'm fascinated by it and honestly i, I think it's it troubles me that I think it's something that gets buried under people speaking generally and broadly about the phenomenon of of, of woke shows, because I, I find it to be something quite a bit more kind of n nefarious and and kind of uncanny and unprecedented. And one of the reasons why when you and I were batting around this idea for a show, I wanted to bring on Geo is because I know this uh, this this man is. Um, my art historian. And I, I think it really does deserve its own scrutiny and it, its own term. A, a woke Trojan horse is a working title, by the way, if we can think of a better neologism tonight, let's, let's do it. But, um, you know, I think I, it, it just unsettles me a lot more than things that just kind of come out of the gate woke. Whether, I mean, even if it's an adaptation of a pre-existing product, if it's, you know, if in episode one, it's woke, there's still something that there's a, it's a bit more of a, a fair fight, I guess, or, or it still seems like there's something kind of above, above board about the, the subversion and the transgression. But I find it very eerie and, and unsettling that the, I, I think the way I put it to you, Oren, in an email was you know if we think about other eras you know before television you know if you if you were just staring at an oil painting of Napoleon Bonaparte from like the 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 1700s it's not going to suddenly become a oil painting about gay marriage or <laughs> <laughs> no, well, actually, no, no, they could be. It could be last. Maybe time. if you look at it, it long be. and hard enough. Given the hermeneutics of it over time, given enough academics, it will be. Right, right. So well, but, well, I mean, Gio, tell me, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong here, but uh, is yeah. there any anything that would have, that, that has existed that you think would be kind of comparable in any kind of artistic medium hmm. to to a TV show just having its having its messaging be completely kind of subverted and, and undermined like this. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, well, the, a lot of the Greek pictorial art, I mean, that always has in the minds of academics, homoerotic subtext. Uh, there is ambiguity though. Caravaggio, for instance, I mean, let's face it. He kind of was a closeted gay man, but like there, there, in terms of his outlook, there, there always is sort of a, uh, a level of profanation there but but when you're what you're talking about though is when it comes to visual medium when it comes to the art of reproduction that is afforded by certain you know technology such as the camera 
the fact that narratives can change and shift. It seems that we live in, especially now, is the age of the series. It seems that the Hollywood film, after the, uh, for YouTube purposes, the certain medical um, state of exception that happened in the previous two years, it seems that series work is now the thing, and the Hollywood movie is like on its on its last legs. But when it comes to a narrative medium, the fact that it can be so subverted so easily, I think that's your point. Whereas it takes a lot of intellectual uh, let's call it uh, intellectual subversion to take a painting like a William Waterhouse painting and say that, you know, it, it represents some unique form of either, you know, uh, social messaging or subversion or, for example, the way they canceled Picasso because he painted certain ladies of the night. So therefore, the um, the figures of the three women that has a new subtext, which is evil and terrible and patriarchal. Uh, but, you know, but what you're saying is the direct transmission of the message over a sort of a narrative piece over time how that sort of shifts which i think is also very interesting so yeah you're right you're right to point out that it seems with series work in particular there's this unique element of subversion yeah, yeah and i guess i should i should say i i, I think there's kind of multiple potent multi, it, it's hard to read into things some of the time um but but there there are multiple agendas or, or multiple things at play i think in some circumstances it may have sort of always been the intention to sort of you know turn the dial up to 11 with the the progressive messaging and it was just a matter of of kind of yeah. lulling you take season 1 to just kind of um get people acclimated to a series and then it gets um it gets subverted, but I think in other circumstances, it it feels much more to me like it it has been kind of torn out of the creators or the showrunners' hands, and really just becomes someone else's yeah. the, someone else's possession or the the product of a bureaucracy. Um, I'll give you a good example, though. Oh, sorry, where you go ahead? Oh, no, 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 go right ahead. Well, no, I, I was. I, good yeah, go yeah. <laughs> everyone go ahead no i was just gonna say that that i think that's a big part of it that you hit there last things at the end where you're talking about the committee taking over right like one of the things about these is that there's such an involved production they happen over time like Gio was talking about and because they happen over time and you know, unlike a movie they end up with a lot more writers like movies get notes of course like they they have the the studio process and in many ways movies are are now so much more made by committee which is why they're such garbage now but this is even more true of tr uh, true tv shows because no one's writing like the full run for the most part of these shows and so that means that you've got many many different hands that can shape and craft this as it, as it goes each one is getting different kinds of notes each one is bringing their agenda to it and over time when you have kind of this woke subversion throughout hollywood even if there's a singular vision that was provided by a showrunner that might have been more based the people who are going to come in after them, the people who are going to have control of that project, especially as it grows and becomes more important as a media franchise and needs to appeal and have its rough parts smoothed out for a wider distribution. You're going to see that stuff creep in over and over again. Yeah, exactly. But oh, so you go ahead, last thing. So yeah, I think I guess one one other point to add about about this is I, I think it's. We when we were dealing, I mean, Geo's right. We are kind of living in the the era and the epoch of of the series, and when we were, were, were when the primary art form was really just film, you had a lot of films that were kind of a reaction or a revision of existing um, ex pre existing movies or genres that that really kind of came out as a critique. I, I mean, one example that I've used in one of my videos is um, uh, the Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood. That's, oh, a, yeah. that's a Western. That's, that's really an anti-Western. Um, a lot of people have written about it, but it's, it's something that's trying to kind of critique the John Ford style um, cookie cutter Western of, you know, the lone gunman, the kind of earlier Clint Eastwood movies, like the good and the bad and the ugly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it, it, it's something that came out of a critique of Westerns. It, it would not exist were it not commenting on these more straightforward and simplified genre films. But now it's, it's that critique happens within the same artifact, within the same, uh, <laughs> within the same narrative. And it's, it's so, um, it's so, it's so jarring and strange. You can sort of see sometimes this battle 
this this struggle for happening within a show. I, I find myself sort of watching two dramas at once. There's the superficial surface level drama of a television program. And then there's sort of what the, the what I'm able to read in as sort of the political drama occurring within the executive producers <laughs> or the writer's room um, for these, yeah. you know, for these characters or for the, um, the messaging. And I mean, that, that is really what um, I'm trying to kind of articulate. I know obviously people are going to have different interpretations of, of paintings or that there's, there's always the possibility that a, a very talented critic could um, provide an interpretation uh, that that undermines the intentionality of the the writer. You know, we could go full Foucault here and death of the death of the the author. But I think I'm describing something that's a lot less um, subtle than anything that Foucault was getting at. I'm not talking about you know the writer's intentionality doesn't matter because of whatever subconscious desires or um, you know political power structures to which they are subject are subtly inflecting their work. I'm talking about people just getting kicked out of the writer's room or the director getting kicked out of the director's chair by woke Janissaries. I think um, to give you a genealogy though, speaking of Foucault, uh, someone mentioned, I think Merkley mentioned Stalker. Can, can you woke fight Stalker? You can't because Stalker is like the quintessential anti-woke film. Uh, not No, I shouldn't say that. No, Stalker is a metaphysical film that defied basically every film censorship board in the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, I have I, my Patreon, actually. I have a, a bit about Stalker. Uh, but what, So there was this question, I believe it was around December before Christmas. Someone asked, it was one of these viral tweets. They asked, um, when did Hollywood become woke? What show was it where it started? And of course, people give out the answers like Sex and the City. Um, you know, what's another um, house? I saw a few times house you could hmm. say because medical dramas always are at the field, but here's, here's a little red pill for you guys. Okay. You want to know the real beginning of it. Go all the way back to the late seventies, early eighties, Norman Lear, all of it, except for Sanford and sons, mostly, mostly all of the Norman Lear shows, like all in the family mod was about women's lib all in the family was about multiculturalism like this was the genesis norman lear and his television empire was like directly the genesis of like quote unquote woke daytime television and people don't know this because if you look at the later seasons of all in the family for instance they were like you know um what, what was the wife's name uh oh what was her name the the wife she died later in the seasons um archie bunker's wife what was her name I forget. Um, but, you know, she befriends like a lesbian and there's a thing about, a you know, a certain medical procedure all the time. Uh, yeah. Someone mentioned Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy, of course, was the acceleration of it. And when you actually look at the evolution, for example, of medical shows in particular, you could like see like they progressively go, for example, House, there's like this ambiguity there where they have to topple the old order of like Christian religious America and so House, oh yeah, Edith, sorry, thank you, chat, Edith. So House was like the, the, the peak of like the new atheists, you know, like the four horsemen. And so you have like House debating about God with Watson. And, but then by the time you get to newer medical shows, like Grey's Anatomy, then you get to even newer shows nowadays. Like um, what's that one, New Amsterdam? Every single week it's about like trans and a certain other medical procedure. Like it, it, they hit you in the face with it. But if you look at the history of television, it slowly but surely creeps towards a certain direction. And other people are pointing in the chat Star Trek. I mean, I grew up in a Star Trek household, but I, I realized that, you know, very early on, Star Trek was sort of like the uh, end of history dream. You know, even. Yeah. 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 But yeah no, I think it's interesting that you, you make the point about medical shows, because what's interesting is the way they end up woke most of the time or some of their most uh, aggressively woke ones are always episodes where like the doctor has to make decisions in contradiction yeah. to the parent. Right. 
the the parent is backwards the parent has some silly religious faith or some kind of uh you know backwards idea about how we do things and it's really important that i as an enlightened you know progressive uh professional step in and separate yeah, this yeah. poor child from the authority of their backward parent so that i can now you know use the authority of the state to press this onto these you know these rubes these chuds that hold that cling to their <laughs> gods and their guns right so i do yeah. think that I had not thought about it that way, but but that is very interesting. But before we get too far into just wokeness in general, because we we will hit that uh, for sure, I do want to get to the specific shows that we had kind of talked about here, so that we can kind of ground this. We have a lot we have a lot of these uh, ideas floating on the surface, but I want to tie this to kind of the particular process that we're talking about. So the first things that last thing had sent me was uh, the boys, which I think is interesting because when I watched the boys. I saw at the very beginning, they're just dunking on Christians, right? They have these really dumb, like really, really ugly, um, uh, you know, uh, pot shots at Christians right away. So I didn't really see it as a base show. But then last things had, you know, some critiques about uh, the boys that pointed to some of the things that they were attacking. They were talking about corporatization, militarization. They were talking about kind of the veneer, the neoliberal veneer of a lot of this stuff. So there are some messages in there that you're looking for that I could see as base. So, so last things, do you want to lay out kind of the groundwork for this transition of the boys? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. And um, as, as Oren mentioned, I, I do have like a, a three part video series where I go into depth uh, about the, the boys, um, but I won't I won't take 90 minutes to, to do this. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right to point out, Oren, that there's a lot of anti-Christian messaging right out the gate in that show. Although in, in defense of the boys, Garth Innes, who wrote the comics, is... Um, that's kind of something that happens throughout his comics as well. I don't know if any sure, of you guys sure. read like Preacher. I was like, I was a 90s comic kid. So oh, that yeah. kind of um, proto new atheism has been part of Garth Ennis's work. Um, so that's not necessarily something that the, uh, the studio uh, had to, had to add in there. But I think focusing on the, the part of the show that was always the most fascinating and innovative and fun for me was the soups, um, like the superheroes, which are just these ut utterly, you know, cynical black comedy um, pot shots at, you know, Cape, Cape shit, Marvel movies. Um, and that's really where the, the, the heart and the soul of the show lives. Um, there's a, and there's a ton of kind of bureaucracy with the, um, the superheroes dealing with the the mega corporation that 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 runs them that sort of subtly mirrors what you imagine a a, a um a a tv show to be like right so there's a kind of a meta commentary going on because all of the superheroes are in care are terribly concerned about their their nielsen ratings and the uh, you know that their twitter followings and their presence and their personas um but uh, in particular, like the, the figure of Homelander, who's this sort of composite sketch of, of Superman and Captain America, sort of the most absurdly patriotic um, superhero, wears like a red, white, and blue spandex. Uh, it, it, in, this, in season one, he's sort of this personification of just terrible, corporate, insincere, canned, um, come overly commodified media. Um, and I, I think, and I, I, I honestly, I know I, I've heard sort of secondhand from people in the industry that they did not like they, the, the show, the show was somewhat surprised at the, uh, affection and attention that it received from its audience as, as sort of a potentially dissident show. Um, the people that that were complimenting it and and found value in it were not necessarily you know Overton window libs, <laughs> but um, so by by season two all of this stuff gets gets subverted in in a really really kind of ham fisted absurd ways like they they attempt to sort of transform Homelander into more of like a like a Donald Trump figure or somebody who's trying to like seed QAnon, 
you know, style. Don't they fight like a white knack group? Is that their main yeah. enemy? Well, yeah. and I mean the big. I mean the big. The they big, literally the, named the new character like Stormfront. Stormfront. Yeah, <laughs> the, the biggest. The, the, the biggest, the biggest <laughs> wrench that they throw into the gears is that he like that. That's he, beautiful. He, his girlfriend. There's a new superhero that come, that joins his team, who's an ex Nazi. Uh, that he fall, you know, he 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 winds up becoming romantically involved in, and she just sort of starts uh, corrupting him and feeding his ego and persuading him into being being more of a more of a right wing megalomaniac than a left wing megalomaniac. Well, um, you're really un underselling this though, because like she comes in and they they sell her as like. Uh, she's the anti-woke person, right? Like she comes in and she's not, you know, she's not playing the game everyone else is playing. She's not doing, you know, she's a strong female, but she doesn't she's need the, huntress. The, the feminism and everything, right? Like, so so they, they really lean into this on the way up. And then of course it turns out that actually she's leading you know, him down this path, right? Yeah, and it's funny too, because I like when, when it first started, when they first introduced Stormfront, I mean, it's obvious from the name and from, you know, she has this like all black SS style uniform. She's got this, you know, haircut that's kind of fashy, new wave fashion. So it's obvious that they're like, the, the, the aesthetics are, you know, mid-century German. But when it, when, it, when it first started with the first few episodes, I still thought that that was this meta commentary on like on on wokeness in some way because i was like they're gonna make her woke but it's really saying that like woke people are as intolerant as um you know as <laughs> as the the mid-century germans or something like that i didn't think that they were gonna go full bore oh no she is in fact like she's been she she i mean she was alive during world war ii she's like you know quasi so wait, she gets de-radicalized and then she becomes woke is that what it the whole thing is? no she doesn't she it, it was it was as as oren was trying to describe it's it's kind of a bait and switch you mm. you you suspect that she is going to be kind of like the character that's um that's taking the piss out of everything um and you you know so that p uh, people kind of sympathize with her she seems kind of cynical and um uh and with it, but then they, as the season progresses, she gets more and more homicidal and 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 crazy, and and more and more of a cartoon character. You well, know, so the they were trying to pull like the libs of the real Austrian painters, but it just didn't work. Like, is that? Well, no, it's much worse. Like, they, it's it's uh, we want to. So, so the interesting part about this, like the 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 based part that last things is talk about, the reason that the the show had its audience in the beginning is that they're so they're attacking all the things that were safe to attack back when like George W Bush was in charge. Yeah, it's right? safe like, edgy, yeah. Corporate corporations are bad, you know, pharmaceutical companies are bad, media companies are controlled by by the government blah blah blah. So they're doing this routine. The problem is that all the things that they're targeting now are very obviously run by progressives today. Oh, and, I get. Yeah, so it's the lag between when the so comic is written Exactly. Oh, but the cultural lag oh. between the 90s attack and the actual yeah. people in power of the in these positions in 2022 means that the people they're attacking is inadvertently the progressives. And so once people start picking up of like, oh, wait, all the people who like this show like it because it's actually attacking progressive institutions, they need to find a way to like make it very clear that actually all these institutions are secretly Nazi institutions. And oh, so like, the, and yeah. so this character has yeah. to turn out to have been like seeding this ideology into all these interactions. We have to make it very clear. We're not attacking like woke Google or woke Apple or, you know, woke Merrill lynch where the, these co corporations are all actually secretly mid-century germans it's and, and, it's, and so yeah. now we're on the right team guys right everyone's on the same team right it's almost now. like an irony leftist view of reality where it's like you know um the cia funded fascist groups in south america it's all about that it's all about like <laughs> it's all about the corporations actually they're secretly in bed with uh i guess russia's all funding us or do you get money from the kremlin it's I mean, incredibly uh, difficult to get rubles in Canada nowadays, but you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, the conversion's a little weird, but we work it out. You know. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? It's, it's basically like the woke Bernie bro view of reality where the corporations are actually against us. Oh, by the way, it's like Noam Chomsky saying that academia is ultra right wing because they take money. 
It's right. like that, yeah, yes. you know, yeah. Not to like, you know, beat up on the old man, but it's, but like you were saying that culture lag between the Bush era, um, it reminds me and like, forgive me for using this example. I know he's not our guy. Right. And, and he's speaking of irony leftists, but uh, there was this um, article by Sam. Chris, do you remember Sam Chris Oren when he was back no. before he got canceled? Well, he was like one of those, he was hovering around Chapo, but he's a great writer though. I got to give him that. He's a great writer. He's a great cultural critic. And he had this article about the new Matrix movie where he said there was this moment in the like late 90s where you had the slew of media, whether it was like um, certain television shows like The Outer Limits, whether it was The Matrix itself or like Existence, which I feel is like the more mature work, you know, by Cronenberg. And basically you could critique the system as being an illusion. And it was sort of like all, all of this isn't real. But then he goes, as time goes on, when it comes to the 2010s, the sort of culture revolution of the 2010s, now it's no longer question everything. Now it's like, listen and believe, right? So now media is telling you that it's not the system and it's sort of intransigent ideology that's the problem, or it's rather like these other things and the system is there to give you salvation. If mm. you like, you know, consume product and like, you know, get excited for the new show or a new season or whatever. So that cultural shift is, it's hugely significant. And when you see all these shows, like, especially like as soon as they hit like the mid 2000s and the 2010s, then you could start to see it. Like it's, it's in, with cop shows, you know, like uh, one of the last great ones was The Shield. I'm currently watching The Shield. Oh man. Yeah. That's an amazing <laughs> yeah. show. You know, it's, yeah. what's interesting is that the approved, one, right? So. <laughs> I have not, I have not watched The Shield, but every time I, I, I go to Twitter or I, or I talk to anybody, any of our guys and I'm like, what do I watch? I need something to watch. Can I please, please tell me something that it's not going to, that isn't woke and it's not going to become woke. Every single time people just tell me to watch the shield. And they're right. It's, yeah. <laughs> what do we not, do does it get subverted at any, at any point? No, in later seasons? no, it's cheap. No, it yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm shocked. They let it, they let it get greenlit for seven seasons. It's incredible. Yeah. But um, it's, you know, what's funny though, is if you watch, um, like other Anglosphere shows around the 2000s, if you watch, for example, Australian or British cop dramas or medical dramas, they start off having their colloquial sort of ways of doing things that are unique to them, right? Because they're still, in, but the fact that they're still English language, as soon as you get around to like 2007, 2006, then they have to like respond to the American culture industry. Like, for example, when, um, when what was that show cia uh C ncis not ncis um csi was really big right yeah to, there's a million variations of it yeah 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 but the, the original one with grisham right sure so if you look at like british cop shows and australian cop shows it's like you could see the later seasons transforming to be like not necessarily woke but like more like bombastic and like action orientated and americanized and so there was this like huge transition throughout the Anglosphere where basically medical dramas, cop dramas, they had to basically conform to like the big, huge American culture industry. And of course, this was the era before the internet like sunk everyone into different forms of media. Because mm -hmm. like back in the day, like everyone watched uh, CSI, like everyone watched, you know, the game or whatever. Nowadays, I mean, I think the culture industry is in some ways panicking because there is such a dearth of there's such like a, a glut of like media you can choose. That's why streaming services are so big, you know? So, I mean, that's my observation. I think like the whole like cultural moment on mainstream media, they're still around, but it's not as significant as like, for example, an internet meme going viral, like, like a woman filming herself in the gym saying like, she's a 21 year old minority and a guy's creeping on her. Like when he's not really right. It's, it seems like they have no, they have little control over like mass cultural happenings anymore, but I could be wrong though. I could be wrong. Well, the next yeah. one, uh, or did you have anything else you wanted to touch on with uh, the boys before we moved on there? Last things. I, I don't think so. Um, if, if people are curious, uh, my, the, um, I've got a three parter on my channel. They could, they could hear everything I have to say about it there. And, and season one's worth your time. I'll say that much. 
Yeah, yeah, no, you've you've gone to it very through it very extensively and did a good job. So we'll direct people that way. So the next one that you wanted to mention was Peaky Blinders. Now this one is interesting because I really only watched the first season. It was good, but I just wasn't like in a space where it grabbed me at the time. And so I only saw that first season. So I didn't see it go woke or or, or kind of change over time. But what were the things that you kind of saw in there? Last things that you saw where was this transition? Yeah, sure. And I, you know, I will. I, I will admit that I feel like this is this is a a more subtle shift and one that probably a lot of people that stuck with the show did not did not necessarily catch. I really wish I could take off the the nightmare vision goggles. Like I I can't even I can't watch just sit and watch shows with my wife anymore. <laughs> At some point I'll just step I'll step up and leave the room and say no it just went it just went 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 woke. But so Peaky Blinders is um it's based off an actual historical person in a historical gang from um, post World War One uh, England. It's specifically the city of Birmingham and the, the character of Tommy Shelby, who basically became. It's if you could think of it as sort of like World War One era British Sopranos. It's about this crime family. It's a family of gypsies that sort of establishes this criminal empire. Very very gritty. Very noir. The main character is this this World War One veteran, um, total nihilist. He's been shelled during the war, um, suffering from PTSD, and is just just kind of ruthless, willing to do anything he can to to to, to get ahead in the world. Um, so very 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 much a noir style show, um, beautifully shot. And so fast forward, however. I don't forget if it's on season four or season five, but but the latest season, essentially the the arch nemesis, the the main villain of of the last season is another histor an actual historical person, Sir Oswald Mosley, who was the the leader of the British fascist party. What really? And he is like, and, and <laughs> Thomas Shelby is like a secret agent working for Winston Churchill to try and undermine. Uh, Oswald Mosley Mosley's ascension because he's about to, you know, get every he's going to he's going to start World War II or or turn um turn the UK into a um a nightmare. And there's other subtle things too. So like the, this is I think I think the BBC and and British stuff, not that this is a BBC BBC show, but I just noticed things in the UK seem to have an even harder time of this, but like you know, Thomas Shelby has a sister who's now in a in a mixed race relationship and and pregnant with a, a biracial child and this is like it's 1920s Birmingham England and like, Where everybody somehow, would have been little England this. back yeah. then like, like somehow half the characters are in mixed race relationships <laughs> like like everything and it just you know it breaks the it breaks the the um the the mirage they got um, an actor that looks like Oswald Mosley my God <laughs> yeah yeah. Yeah, but but um, I, I, yeah, and I'm just like, there's probably no like, Tommy Shell, the real Tommy Shelby probably had no qualms with Oswald Mosley whatsoever. Like, probably not. I, I could I could imagine like it was. Yeah, but violent gang leaders from the 1920s weren't super progressive, is what you're telling me. Like they they might yeah. have had some backwards views, uh, the, you know, on these things, things that today uh the the left would have found very offensive but but we can't portray them that way instead they're all on board with the plan exactly and and i mean the whole the whole premise of the show is that it, that shelby is this this anti-hero who's only out for himself not not seeking redemption sort of refuses any any kind of um black and white definition or understanding of good and evil and then and then i mean very similar i mean this i Often the um, the woke Trojan horse comes in the form of a Nazi or pro like you know pseudo Nazi um, to 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 focus the um, the hero's attention or the the main character's attention um, and and to draw the the viewer's attention away from um, <laughs> liberalism. Poor writing. 
Yeah. <laughs> and really, yeah, precisely, precisely. So, um, yeah, I mean, if neither of you are that familiar with the show, we, we don't have to talk about it. Prepared. No, but that is amazing well, that they that yeah. they managed to transition it to like, yeah, there happens to be a fascist leader of Britain. That's who he's battling, even though he's like a gang member. It's like uh, the Rocketeer when he ends up fighting the 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 mobsters end up fighting the Nazis at the end. Well, I'm still an American, right? Like all of a sudden, the, the, <laughs> yeah, the U.S. Yeah. government and gangsters are in a shootout with the, the Nazis. You know, amazing. Orin, well, we'll get to the Walking Dead, Charles. But uh, yeah. here's a question you, for you, Oren, Actually, can you or I about well both of you? Although Gio, you kind of mentioned, you know, you you see this dating back to shows in the 70s or 80s. But hmm. could either of you pinpoint? I mean, I don't know if either of you suffer this as much as I do, but I little like. I really, I want to, I want to go back. I want, I want the blue pill, at least when, when it comes to like, I want the blue, no, so I, I, want, I want a very specific window of blue pilling in which I can like sit in, on my couch at the end of the day and watch 30 to 90 minutes of television without the nightmare vision goggles, perceiving the, the, the subtext and propaganda of every, every piece of media but can you remember if, if you yourselves find yourself in that situation, could you could you pinpoint a moment or a TV show where that that happened, where you started to just mm. like realize that you were observing um, the, the, the propagandistic elements of a show? You could you could read the agitprop the same way that you were you were absorbing the plot. I think maybe why. What, it when could did have been you first notice the puppeteer's tipping. hands? <laughs> I, it could have been house with the fedora tipping. I don't know. Maybe, maybe yeah. even earlier. I don't know. What do you think, Oren? I mean, I, I can't think of one show, but I can say that probably about four, four or five years ago, it got to the point where I could start the clock on shows and be like, "How many?" You know, my my father in law has this game. Like he he could he'll watch a sh any show. But he'll uh, basically throw it in the trash the minute it gets woke, and so like <laughs> he'll he'll start an episode in and be like, nope, started right away, done. Or you know he'll get a half a season. He's like, nope, they already dropped all the all they checked all the boxes on all the characters. It, it's all coming. I can see it a mile away. So I wouldn't say that there's one show that immediately said, okay, this this is what's happening now, and t all TV is going to be this way. But I, I can say that probably about five years ago, I started feeling the creep, like where every show I started is like all right how long is it going to be until we get the trans care how long is it going to be until we get the speech about racial injustice how long is it going to be until two characters disappear to be replaced by those that meet all the progressive check boxes like you could you could start feeling those you know especially the character replacements like when all of a sudden it's like well <laughs> the main character needs a few more friends you know lo that looks a little too much like a you know like a barbecue in milwaukee here so we really got to switch this <laughs> over you know too many premier colors yeah. yeah exactly exactly more, <laughs> more 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 colors of benetton in the, in, in the show that was now, sorry i gotta forgive me that was a quote from oz where Vern mm. schillinger the ab leader he's like you notice there's a lack of primary colors around here <laughs> I'm like, that was a great show by the way before the sopranos i think uh the template of hbo was laid out with oz but um it's a dark you it's a dark it? world where you you have to go back to a show about gay prison prostitution to find something that's not <laughs> That's not, you know, overly. It truly was anti woke, like the prison prag stuff. But uh, no, Oz was truly an incredible show, even though, like, near the end, you had to, like, suspend your disbelief. But um, what I was going to say about Peaky Blinders is that it seems that, you know, there's a, a sort of like neurotic. Well, I mean, the left is all neurotic character, but there's a certain, like, fixation or fetishism or neurotic fixation with, like, the underclass as harboring revolutionary sentiment it seems like it like even oz i hate to say had this as well like kareem saeed the leader of the muslims had this speech about it right where essentially criminality is equated with like these are the ripe underclasses to commit the revolution and you have like this leftist like literally dating back to the october revolution you have this like leftist obsession in the west with like well actually Mahek and wholesome criminal underclasses, they're the ones that can be the foot soldiers of the revolution. And we see this nowadays with certain, uh, one very prominent group uh, that came into the news recently in Atlanta. We all know that one, right? Um, the the, the one that the FBI is pretty sure doesn't exist. 
Exactly. They don't exist, yeah. by the way. They're like mafia. Uh, to, right. to, you know, they don't exist. Uh, but the, it's like this sort of like revolutionary. Yeah, exactly. Like Langdon Industries, revolutionary pornography, where the underclasses, they're criminals, but at least they're not Austrian painter fans. And actually, they're the vitalistic spirit of the, the, you know, they have this vitalistic spirit that can overturn the regime. And it's like criminality is actually good. And because they're the foot soldiers of the revolution. So, and it seems like consistently in like leftist media, that is like, like comic books have that where, you know, actually the criminal underclass, they're like the downtrodden subalterns that can lead to the better utopian future. Um, if so, we just empty out the prisons, right? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Warren. I just, no, it's so a I have to, concept. But, I yeah. have to jump in here just because there's a show that I watched that was so ridiculous and fits right into this perfectly. It's not one that we discussed earlier, but but I got to throw it in. So there's this new Musketeer uh, uh, redo. I think it was the BBC that did it. Oh, so they're doing no. the three Musketeers. And it's, you know, it's everything you hope it isn't, right? Like, you know, it, it's, it, turn, it turns out that actually all of Sub-Saharan Africa showed up to France at this time but like of one of the one of the amazing things is so one of the um one of the uh musketeers ends up getting into a romantic relationship with a uh black uh revolutionary who is a new immigrant uh into the area and she comes in and she immediately starts printing pamphlets about you know she literally just like this is their, their storyline they created this it feels like something that like um you know that some kind of white nationalist might create as propaganda like she she comes <laughs> like in and she script. like she immediately comes in and says like i'm i'm the one who's going to lead a revolution literally just showed up. Like these people are feeding her, like clothing her. She just got back from a war, but she's like, I'm not being treated correctly. So I'm going to lead an uprising. And she starts like printing subversive literature and gathering all the immigrants together so that they can start like riots over this thing. And like, this is the person you're supposed to be rooting for. Of course, like, the, like she's a hero because she just showed up to France and she's immediately leading like bread riots with, uh, with all of, the people who just traveled into France against the people who are like feeding and housing them as refugees from a war that like they just escaped. And like th th this, is, this is the hero of the show. And so like, it My doesn't God. even occur to them like that they might be portraying like something that people might not want to happen in there. Like this might be some kind of cautionary <laughs> tale. It's, it's almost... About yeah. You know, it, it's, it's insane. Like, like they, they, they're completely, it's like that Netflix show uh, that they had where like the portrayed like camp of the saints, but like they're for it. So it's fine. Like, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys oh, that saw that trailer was... yeah, yeah, for that one, but it's, that but was it's amazing, a, but it's the same thing. It's like, Oh yeah. Like this is something that like the farthest right, you know, person in the world might, might warn you against in their like hysterical, you know, dystopian novel. And we're just portraying it as like the heroic thing that's happening. So we're on board. It's, it's celebration parallax, like all over the place. It's, it's sort of like that new book by who's that journalist yak mood is that his name where he's like oh yeah like the end of christians or white guys or something is that yeah it's yeah. like basically like everything like richard spencer believed in 2007 is correct but actually it's evil so <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's why we have to fight harder um it reminds me of the example of uh the there i maybe i should recommend it's a little too edgy but there's this, one of the best uh, movie review sites is Soiled Cinema. I believe Jack the Perfume Nationalist interviewed the guy. And they had this review of, uh, and here, here's my crazy thesis, uh, because I'm an Italian myself here in Canada, right? So, um, you know, uh, Do the Right Thing, right? Um, yes. Yeah, right, by Spike Lee. Was it Spike mm -hmm. Lee or Spike Jones? I think it was Spike. I, I'm not sure. I, I I don't think I ever saw it, but, like, I'm familiar with the, the movie. Yeah. But, like, basically, it's, like, the evil, racist Italian uh, pizza shop owners against, you know, Mahek... Yeah, Spike Lee. Mahek and Wholesome, you know, by POCs. And, like, the whole point is, like, he gives the one guy a job, but that's not good enough. So, it's, like, then there's this, like, race war riot. And it's, like, it's... it's I believe, truly, that that film was the final nail in the coffin of, like, Italians in America being, like like sort of like Asians, like a semi minority, but still mm -hmm. like has the sort of coding of white America after that Spike Lee film, 
now Italians are racist, ergo Italians are just white people now. You know, so it's like the whole history of like Italian immigration in America and anti-Catholicism and all that. Like that's all against like one of the worst hate crimes ever happened in America was against Italian village. Right. So uh, a little Italy. But, you know, that's all swept under the rug now because we're racist against black people. So it's like um, but the whole the premise of the film is that the sort of civil society that Italians largely conform to, that that was they were complicit in the evil racism of it. So ergo, you know, you'd internalize the culture and become a, you know, become a product of it. You were now yeah, you know, yeah. critical for the system. Yeah. How dare we give the, 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 the guy a job, you know? Yeah. No, I, I will say the Italians didn't do the right thing. We're kind of like, I know someone posted the one dialogue on Twitter, the one pizza shop, <laughs> you yeah. know, they were racist. We, we were, us Italians. We were racist. Don't worry about it. But I, I think it was a bit over the top in terms of like, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Oren, Oren, I just had oh, to sure. say, it's it's funny to hear you describe your, your father-in-law's um, game that he plays where he mm-hmm. walks on in until it goes woke <laughs> because I, this is my, the next video I'm working on is on, is on Neil Gaiman's Sandman since that was oh, recently good. adapted. I wanted I to talk about it so we can, we can talk yeah, about yeah. that. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I will definitely have you on to talk about it. But I, I told myself, I was like, I know, I know this is going to make me upset. This is going to be terrible. So I, 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 I made a deal with myself. I said, I will watch this up until I encounter the first character, the first cherished character that I remember from my, you know, my adolescence reading these comics is made is either seconds, had, has, so. has either had their gender or their race reversed yeah, and it yeah. was literally the first character that yes on screen. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah um, no that that show is amazing because yeah they they obviously they change everything like constantine is a female now i've heard that uh defended because they don't they can't have the rights to the same constantine because it's still like it's still going in like the wb show or whatever so so maybe you can give them a pass on that one but yeah no uh, like Mm. death you know like like the 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 entire character is based around like the super pale goth girl that's the iconic look that's like everything about that character and yeah no completely re-racialized immediately because of course um so yeah i know that that show is a mess top to bottom which is very sad like it's weird because neil gaiman is of course proto woke in some yeah. ways but in other ways uh his like sandman is very aggressively uh, uh offensive for woke people like there, there's mm. an entire like he introduces a trans character in some of the later comic books for for like a series but the character is explicitly told by the gods that it's not female like you can pretend all you want, but the gods know. And like in and, and right. the characters not allowed to go on journeys that other characters go on because the gods don't care how you identify. Like at the end of the day, like there is a truth that you cannot subvert. You know, they, they can see past you. So like it, it yeah. so there it's weird because because Gaiman talks about like eternal truths in in a, in, a, in a kind of petersonian way like he had the, like there's these different archetypes that are built in and these structures and that's a lot of what gaiman is drawing on even though he himself is very clearly like progressive in his ideology he's drawing on things that are too deep and ancient to subvert entirely and yeah. so like he, a lot of those things aren't uh he he still carries too much baseness into his stories even if he's trying to subvert it in some ways He's very interesting. I mean, I hate to use the the word, but he is a transitionary figure because he, yeah. I mean, he's somebody that's obviously completely. Most Gen enmeshed, X writers are that, yeah. Enmeshed in the the Western literary tradition. I mean, a lot of the characters within Sandman are like Mark Twain, William Shakespeare, characters from Greek mythology. You know, he's, he's not, he, he, he's, he occupies this strange sort of, um, I don't know, like, you know, missing neanderthal cousin between like (laughs) the missing link no but they could do it though with with mythological characters i mean there are a lot of academics that talk talk about like certain myths like inanna and in sumar that are like proto trans Mm -hmm. um they they always talk about like uh i said this to me therese once where there's a huge body of academic literature where like christ is trans like and you know like what they're doing right this is total subversion but of course even even like 
the media of like yesteryear didn't seem that like bad, even though it had like an anti-racist or like a proto woke message, like Nullis, my good friend Nullis in the chat. Um, I said my good friend, there you go. That's a geo bingo card right there. Uh, he said, he mentioned the heat of the night, but in the heat of the night, like it was like proto anti-racist, but it had like the whole, like normie boomer con sort of like they're both kind of prejudiced like that one scene where um they're like uh oh what's his name like rod steiger's character the sheriff he's talking to the detective and and he's like i want to get that white guy and he's like oh you're just like the rest of us boy and it's like that sort of recognition yeah. but then like for example if you were to remake in the heat of the night now i could only imagine like the terror of it, like it would just be like totally over the top. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, which is another thing. I think it's funny. Cause yes, last week on my channel, me and Prude, we were talking about the, um, the Mark Fisher um, lecture that came from his book, the slow cancellation of the future, but his book was called ghosts of my life, right. About hauntology. And it seems like a lot of these like, mo and let's face it, they're mostly millennials in like my generation, the writing staff nowadays, of these shows on, prime and netflix and so forth it's it it's very much like they've submitted to the lackluster culture killing phenomenon of like total like post or hyper modernity where mark fisher talks about you know everything can come back there's no distinction between past and future you could take a classic like velma from scooby-doo and make her woke and you know fred is like a a, a nep a, a racist nepo kid and velma is like this woke goddess mindy kaling and it's like but really when you examine that you would think that the revolutionary left that they would be the ones to create media that breaks through that conditioning but really no the future isn't this utopian vision the future is actually the postmodern robbing of the past for the service of the present which is really crazy. They almost submitted to the reality of hauntology and all of these shows, like even the shows that we're discussing now, they like have this pervasive, like trope nature. They're very tropey. It's like, we're going to take old tropes and we're going to subvert them. It's like, that's good enough for us. Like it's, that's it's just going to make money. Right. Cause all these like terminally nostalgic millennials watch this crap, but who knows? Geo, right? this is, this is really interesting. I have, I'm going to make you read the, the script to my, to my Sandman video before I, I record <laughs> it because you're, no, you're entering into like some of the themes that, that I'm trying to explore. And I think that Sandman is a, a very strange and, and the adaptation is something strange to examine because real and Oren, Oren, you were touching on this too, because what's so, what, I'm I'm developing such a rarefied taste for like the the wokeification that that like sometimes the the decisions the 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 intricacies or the subtleties of the decision making is is something that sticks with me and puzzles me because Sandman the whole series is 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 honestly something you could not hand hand a next a Netflix producer a more perfectly gift wrapped multicultural like. <laughs> Um, you know, check off the boxes. I mean, they, like there are characters, there are main characters, like it is a pan-optic globalist series from the 90s, mm -hmm. but they're like, you know, there are there's there's stories about like af African tribes. There's a character who's like a, a white guy who's immortal that was a slave trader and is now in a relationship with a black woman. There's like- Oh my God, with, that's how far as, they as went. Oren mentioned, as Oren mentioned, there's like, there's a trans character. There's like, I, like women outnumber the men. It is some of the most uh, uh, some of the most beautiful artwork from the series is the uh, the all the uh, stories that take place in uh, in Arab countries like the like it, yeah, it yeah. travels the globe absolutely yeah it's not it's not at all you know west it, it is not necessarily like western centric mm -hmm. in its in its storytelling but um the but first thing, like character a, that I a mentioned slave owner having a relationship with a slave that would be like like you know how they try to like. Um, like basically destroy like the sort of American history by like point out the slavery thing. I thought that was like abuse and exploitation, other things that we can't say on YouTube. Like, like why would they write that in there? I thought that would like have the vibes would be all well, because they're removed by even, generations. They're not, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, okay. it's not the woman who was his slave is now his wife. It's, it's yeah, that it's like, yeah, it's but that. you could write in a woke academic oh, sure. paper about like Absolutely, how that yeah, is the fetishism for the subject. Yeah, it's taking it out yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, it's, it's, we're, see, yeah. this is why, this is why, uh, the, 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 
maybe I shouldn't say I shouldn't mention I shouldn't cause beef with you, uh, Oren. But this is why, like the the the, the dark web, like James Lindsay's the world. You have to actually like you got to read the woke text to really. <laughs> Like, you can't just well, say it's Gnosticism or something, but you know. Hold on, hold on. But here's my here's the main point I'm trying to make about about the Sa Sandman subversion. So there's plenty of stuff that's just like handed off. The the and and there are e but there are even characters who it would not be that glaring or that offensive or that disruptive to the plot if you changed th their race or their genders. They're they're there are still kind of characters that I would be like, okay, I'll give that to you. It's it's a freebie. But the the first character that comes on screen, the one that I I, I mentioned, was the the original character in the comic comic book is Sandman's Butler, who's who's a a, a British Anglo archetype, PG Wodehouse Butler. Like this is the most this is the most Anglo like the most archetypically Anglo like gentleman servant and and you know he's a he's a a character in the dreaming so he's supposed to like what gives life to him what gives form to him is actually the fact that this does exist as an archetype within people's imaginations like you think but you hear the word butler you think british like stodgy british white dude and it's been, and and the and the character's name is 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 now lucien and is being played by a, a woman from ghana and it's it's sort of it, it that's the part that's so that's so strange and so um so like honestly it, it's sort of it it the horror <laughs> it, it 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 verges on horror the the at the level at which they go to um to 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 subvert to to change and alter the characters where it makes the least sense it's the least plausible it's the most it's gonna make it's gonna be the it's gonna make the tiniest possible noise, you know. Like they had a fat. There were there are dozens of characters that are th that would be um, less glaring, and 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 that's the one that they they choose to sort of turn inside out. Um, sorry, isn't James Bond a black woman now? I, that's Only what matter I time. Heard. Only a matter of time. So, oh, so Gio, I, I want to make sure because you were you were talking about The Walking Dead, and I want you to get mm. a chance so that we don't we don't run you off before you get your your examples here. So, Walking Dead is another one of those shows. I think I watch four or five. I mean, it's got to be a trillion seasons now, right? Yeah, like, I think but, the show has some of the worst writing uh, I've ever yeah. seen. <laughs> so, 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 I read most of the comic books. I read you know a hundred hundred some issues of, of the comic books, but I, I only made it to like season four or five of the show. But what's what's your transition on this one? How did it go from somewhat base to woke? Okay, I think that, that this is a longer point. I think that mm -hmm. a lot of these shows, like the essence of them, is that they still have to get like they have to have a get for like largely like male kind of like still mostly white nerdy audiences, especially like comic book series type of stuff or like any sort of action orientated franchise. And so with the walking dead, like my video on it, I essentially said that it was like the white savior sunsetting, like riding off into the sunset, literally. And it's like now it's the multiracial, multisexual coalition of the willing that are to take up the place of Rick Grimes, who is like the white savior who sacrificed his own lineage, his own livelihood, his own standing to give it off to this cast, like this motley crew of, uh, you know, no, no relationship is single race or single sex. Like there's always like, 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 you know, lesbians in the apocalypse. I'm pretty sure that, you know, fertility age women, when most of the world's population is decimated, I'm pretty sure that there's just uh, lesbians everywhere. Right. So, but also with the walking dead, it gives you the aesthetic of it being like a, a masculine show. Right. But then as time goes on, you have like the main characters are all like girl bosses apart from like Daryl who's like still, again, another white savior that gives himself to the girl bosses to do their work, to, to lead society. And then at the very end, where you, you know, not spoiler alert, when you have the, the last like bureaucratic apparatus, what are they called? The, the Commonwealth. You have like a female villain, but of course, like 
it's not even about like saving the people that are there. It's just the group of the original survivors that are there. Like it's the, the Alexandria group. There's this one scene where, um, where uh, they're walking and the guy who's like the henchman for um, the woman that runs the, the Commonwealth, he's like, well, you guys have an opportunity to save everyone. What are you going to do after this? And, and uh, Carol is like, there is no after this. You don't realize that we're number one. And it's like, you guys, who cares? Because what happens with Walking Dead is the formula is they find a new villain, they find a new group, and then, you know, thousands of people die, millions must die, <laughs> and, like, they move on, right? And it's like all their pretensions to saving people or to arrive at a normal life are gone. But along the way, the villains progressively get more ridiculous, but they get less nuanced. They and so, for example, the governor. My argument in the video was essentially that the group from Alexandria that they're the wrong ones, and that all their villains they were the real ones that knew that in this environment, in this world, you have to do what needs to be done. It's very Nietzschean in a sense. Like Negan, who would win in that war, Negan or Rick Grimes? Negan would win because yeah. he has the will to power, right? right? But Negan's evil. He has a harem. He's sexist. He's, you know, he's like all of the patriarchy wrapped up in one. But then Negan, his humiliation ritual is he's captured by the group and they lord it over his head for eternity. Like, uh, what's her name? Um, he killed Glenn, the husband. What's her name? Um, oh, the his, his wife. Uh, the, yeah. The romantic entrance. Uh, I can't remember all. It's been a while. She since... becomes a girl boss, too. She, yeah. she becomes a leader. So it's basically Negan is Mia culping for, I believe, nine years into the apocalypse. That's how long it takes. Like, they jump to the future, like, in, in I believe, season 12 or 13. And so it's like Negan, Negan is the evil patriarchy that has been brought to heel by the girl boss, multicultural, multisexual world order. Maggie, thank you very much, Charles. Maggie. And so Maggie, like, lords it over his head for like multiple seasons it's hilarious and of course rick grimes is still in the background but even the presence of rick grimes becomes spiritualized he is an ideal later on and of course i think in the movie that they're making he comes back right but um no but oh, he they're making a movie oh god no they're making a movie and they're making three other spin-off seasons series including the two spin-off series and by the way they have, my mother watches all this crap i only watched the, the original one and maybe a little bit of the the other walking dead one um and so they have the zoomer version called the i think it's called uh, the walking dead um beyond the beyond something it's like a zoomer version of it and that's even worse that there, like there's no white savior there there's just like 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 zoomer transmogrify yeah. <laughs> like you know they're sexually ambiguous soy you like you know all the adjectives right all the adjectives a lot of so cat what, girls yeah 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 cat girls um but they're like zoomer cat girls of course right? of course yeah yeah so they they have a unique sort of like ambiguity in terms of racial and sexual character put it lightly right so the walking dead it has the aesthetics of an old Western in terms of it confront man confronting the wilderness and, and man sort of arriving at a post-apocalyptic future. But that vision of the post-apocalypse is then subverted to the service of the present. It's very much like what Nick Land said in Xeno systems with all of the stuff we're talking about today, where he said that current liberalism is the enslaving and erasure of both the past and the future in service of the present, whereas mm -hmm. traditionalism is the, you know, present and future in service of the past. And of course, futurism is like everything is towards the future. But what we have is like the worst of both worlds. Yes. We're in media and everywhere. It's like the present enslaves and erases everything. Like the walking dead is a post-apocalyptic vision of the present into a post-apocalyptic future that that present would maintain that we're going to have, lesbians and trans people well no the last didn't the last of us have a trans woman oh i could go on about the last of us for a few yeah. minutes. you know but you know what's funny the memes though were great like the, the the choking meme like that was like there was this one where it was um it was chris chan being choked by sonichu and chris chan's like i created you 
I don't know why that, I find that funny. That's the, terrible. The thing <laughs> that puzzled me about the the Last of Us again, I again like watched like the first episode and was like, I'll just go until that it pisses me off too much. But they <laughs> they did not. This is this is something that has left me scratching my head. Maybe you guys can help me think through this. But so they did not wind up. I mean, did you guys played the video game? You kind of know the basic premise. I'm familiar with the video game. I haven't seen the show yet. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the main characters are Joel, who's this this older guy who loses a daughter in the apocalypse, and then he winds up um, being the guardian and the steward and the shepherd of this Fred's replacement daughter, other little girl who's his quasi daughter named Ellie. And they, they don't turn Ellie black, but they turn his daughter black. And the daughter, yeah. the daughter is basically only there like for the first 30 minutes, you know, you kind of like, she's sort of like the prologue of the story. And I was like, why didn't they, I mean, if they had just turned Ellie into if they had just turned Ellie black, then it would have gotten like way more screen time for a, a POC. It would have probably like angered the fan base of the, um, the video game more. And I think it's strange to notice that like something about how I feel like there's, there's more, there's something more, there's more cachet in, in showing, mixed race children or even just alluding to mixed race couples than there is to having a sort of higher higher count of of um actors of color you know it's so, just well that's like the walking dead where you have rosita who is latina who goes with an like an indian doctor right like i mean subcontinental indian right and who is but then he gets killed and is raised by a black pastor as a, like a replacement father. So like that you have like the tri the tri so so I can actually answer your question last things like why yes. they didn't do this. So so the first thing it, like I just would like to note is that means that they they killed the uh, the black character immediately in the horror uh, show that's which, true yeah which is that's the an trope, trope in of itself really... right yeah. <laughs> yeah so but but like the actual answer to your question is that later on in the second video game and uh which i haven't played but i think i saw if i remember correctly and someone correct me if i'm wrong it's I've, I've heard that it's an it's a nightmare of subversion so, the second so she, so she uh the ellie the the i believe is the name of the of the of the surrogate uh a daughter yeah she ends up um having a romantic relationship with a black female she becomes a lesbian in an interracial relationship and you can't do that if you've already gender swapped you can't get the interracial you'd, you'd have to like gender gender swap the eventual uh interracial uh, lesbian relationship again if you if you did it later right right so i yeah. think that's actually why they left her uh as as a white girl so eventually she could enter into her enter the proper interracial yeah. uh yeah but uh, lesbians have to go with lesbians have to go with trans women now i mean that's that's, that, that's what i've heard otherwise <laughs> otherwise they're they're turfs and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're turfs. right you know, they'll, they'll end up getting the recent, destroyed the, yeah. the recent video game with the <laughs> Harry Potter is transphobic compared. To yes, yes, yeah. yeah. But but I wanted I wanted to hit one more thing because we're we're getting near the end here. Um, but uh, I wanted to touch quickly on shows that start with subversion and they go to wokeness just because that's the only place to go once you've burned through all your materials. So the thing that made me think about this, and there's there's plenty of shows like this now, but uh, Last Things just did a video on uh, the magicians, and of course the magicians starts as a subversion right it, it, it starts as a subversion of like the chronicles of narnia and harry potter from the very beginning and yeah. so like they the, the first season or two like it's 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 woke from the beginning but it's got some interesting like because they're just they're, they're subverting all this stuff but after like a season or two there's just nothing left to subvert they've burnt through like all the stuff that they want to like completely you know turn inside out and so the only thing left to do is then just like triple down and just make the wokest possible 
possible <laughs> thing where like everyone is in a thruple or some kind of you know polycule and they're, and they're polycule. all <laughs> they're all marrying oh, you know there, there's interracial marriages and, and and everybody's got the different sexes like everything is you know there's just nothing else to do so they start like <laughs> singing musicals and stuff in the show that used to like have like completely brutal and dark <laughs> scenes like they, they all just break it and break into one big lgbtq musical in the middle of narnia like so like that's all there's left to do because they spent the first two seasons just burning down and like you know like lynching any meaning inside <laughs> these properties right and so like that's a, there's only to do that. and i've noticed Whoa, this with, mega like, point <laughs> yeah <laughs> like like so so i think that like that this is also a thing we see where where you know shows that they're already woke in some sense but like they're completely just subverting everything because that's all they have left to do is just just tear down all these cultural icons like they've got nothing left at the in the last couple of seasons so they just go woke because at least at the end you can like run out the clock by parroting out like woke talking points and that'll pad you out for season two while all the fans argue about like you know the subversion and everything <laughs> i'll be honest Oren, and this is something my my wife always gets really paranoid and angry if i don't watch something i'm going to comment on through to the end but mm -hmm. I, I just, all I could swallow was season one of The Magicians. Oh, like, buddy, you not, have so much I more. I could not go on. I couldn't go on <laughs> oh. another inch. Oh, you could you could have written like three more videos. Trust oh. me, like 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 <laughs> it, it gets it gets bad. It gets um, real bad. Like and it's um it's uh I I ended up, I didn't watch it to the end to be fair. Like I I, I had to stop eventually. But yeah, no, you've got to it, it, it might be worth pushing through for another season. You might get material at like like it's just woke for the acceleration. It <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, but that's what I mean. I feel like that's like the quintessential example of like. Baudrillard's like after the orgy type of scenario where we burn through everything. There's no subversion left. You know, like we've literally subverted everything to the point of exhaustion where we have to like make up no more subversion, which I feel like I hate to say it, but and unfortunately I feel like conservative media is responsible for this as well, where the, the discourse around like the quote unquote woke show is like talked about like as a, a memeified form to exhaustion and i feel like it is true that a lot of these writers they know that if they gender swap or race swap or sexuality swap uh, you know characters that it'll create a news cycle right. and that the usual like conservative like fox news response would be like this is bad like it's almost reminds me of, like bill o'reilly like they should bring him back at well i know I know he had some funny business in Fox News. They can't bring him back. But, you know, he's too old, too. He's too old. But, you know, remember, like, I remember watching The O'Reilly Factor back in the day. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, The War on Christmas, Freedom Fries. Like, all that stuff was already there. But it was like, let's talk about, it, it's like, it was like, same with the Gamergate, the anti-SGW channels. It was like a, it was like a, a weird cartography of the way that culture was going. And the only thing you could do was point it out, laugh at it, move on and to the next absurdity that would come down the pipe. And then when it comes to actual cultural creation, that cycle would continue because of course the people in charge of cultural production now at the most mainstream levels, they themselves experience this like after the orgy type of exhaustion of all culture. And it's sort of, it's really like profound at the level that, like even in 2023 from like 2013 onwards even before that it's like the cultural discourse has largely stayed the same when it comes to pointing out like this is another woke character this is another subversive act and they just keep throwing it out as like people refuse to watch movies anymore that aren't like niche indie films or like you know even like the most mainstream actors they're resorting to doing series small box work like it's even as like the culture industry like just gets torn apart at its own hand, we still are caught up in this like never ending hell world dialectic of like, this is a woke show. It's terrible. We all know it's terrible. They still make shows that are terrible. I don't know why. Don't they lose money? Oh, it doesn't matter. Like it's. Yeah. I, I tried to explain this to people. Like you are an essential part of this cycle. Like the, the, 
you know, the, like when they come out with the rings yeah. of power or whatever, like the the Lord of the Rings subversion, they they write this stuff. They write it woke. They know it's yeah. woke. They and they know it's going to make people angry. They know the fans are going to yeah. get nuts. These these Kotaku articles are written before the show comes out. They are just sitting there <laughs> waiting yeah. for one guy yeah. to be like, "Can you believe they put black women in the rings of power so they can just hit send and publish and start cranking the racists up the articles?" Are pointing out that. The- Exactly. Yeah. Th- th- this. Yeah. They knew you were coming. They knew you were what your response going to be. The show was built with your outrage to the show in mind specifically. Yeah. All the all the uh, outlets that are there to launder your outrage to sell the show to people already had these articles written before you even touched it. You're right. It's, it's an entire meta cycle built on top of all of this woke subversion into I, everything we're consuming. One of the now that I'm I'm talking to you again, Oren. Let me just say, I've used this example on the show with the Prude a few times, but uh, one of the greatest things you ever tweeted once was, I believe this was near Christmas, where it was, um, and you could apply this to like the culture industry as well. I think you were applying to Ann Coulter, where she said, um, like, in, in other words, like, it's about like conservatives not getting like the meta of these arrangements, right, in politics and mm-hmm. culture, where Ann Coulter said, it was about that certain event that happened in January, by the way. I'm not going to say it for you two, but you know, the yeah. one, right? a few years yeah. ago uh, or a few year ago, a few years ago. Uh, Ann Coulter said on Twitter, she tweeted, you mean to tell me that the lesson that liberals learned is that they have to just demonize their opposition. And then you quote tweeted her with, yes, exactly. That's exactly the lesson that they learned. Like, you haven't <laughs> right. gotten this yet. <laughs> yes. like it's... But yeah. culture, it's like the conservatives that freak out about, like this type of culture. I mean, we're doing it. I, I realize that we're performatively doing it. Yes. But I yes. hope like we're we're achieving like a more nuanced perspective. But at the end of the day, it's like the right wing or the conservatives that do like talk about this stuff, they realize that in some ways it's part of a dialectical game that when they come out with even more subversive stuff, then it's like they're already still reacting. Like there's like, like a lot of like Sean Hannity people on Fox News, they're like still talking about like gay marriage in shows, but they moved on to trans people in shows. And then yes. they'll move on to something. They'll, maybe they'll move on to cheese pizza one day. Maybe that will be like a medical drama where don't you know it's ethical to have a mixed age relationship? They'll, they'll, they'll come up with some ridiculous term like that. But it's like as you're fighting the older culture war, it's like they keep the, the, the Cthulhu keeps swimming upwards. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like it's an old reactionary point, but it's the truth. Like, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Last things you there, bro. Yeah, I did. I, we've been drowning him out. I wanted to give him a chance to jump back in. Apparently someone in the chat, uh, uh, someone says I could find love in the chat. So they know. Oh, I don't know why the bots are hitting you tonight. <laughs> oh, are, is it? I haven't. Yeah, I should check it out. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry. Last things. Go ahead. Oh, I, I had a, I had a friend of mine text me and say, I like your woke Trojan horse idea. Unless the showrunner is tied to the mast, they will eventually follow the call of Cthulhu. Um, yep, there you go. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I do hope that, I mean, I think that's why I, I, I wanted to try to focus on, and, and I think we have focused on some shows that at least started out as a bit of a, a, a lighthouse or, or a glimmer in the dark. I think that I, I completely agree with everything you're, you're both saying, and I feel bad kind of feeding feeding the the outrage cycle. But um, I think something that does get drowned out is when these shows that actually look like they at, at some points have half a chance of attaining some degree of sincerity. Um, yeah, you know the 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 you know that that. I find these to be more of a, a, a tragedy and more ca- a, a greater cause for despair than these shows that are just sort of stillborn. Yeah. Into, it's different than workplace. like when shows announce it, like apparently they say that like uh Yellowstone is like, it's such a, like a boomer con type of show, but they even say that that has like girl bossism and different, like, you know, they, there's a critique of Yellowstone there that's almost like the woke Trojan horse. Oh no, that's the only other show other than The Shield that people told me was based and that I should watch. You're killing me, Geo. It is based, but it's sort of like Mahek and Wholesome Homesteader type of based. You know what I mean? Like it's, 
like it's you gotta you know? take you gotta you gotta take what you can get man like you, yeah you can't, true, you can't be true. picky in the desolate wasteland like <laughs> yeah you know, i'm i'm absolutely dying of thirst but this water it's a little you know it's a little low brow like it's, it's a little t- it's a little brown you know it's a little yeah. tainted you know it's got a little dirt in it but um, yeah. Gio, no, you know, oh, if, if, could we yeah. could go back to the walking dead maybe for for a minute sure i, I appreciate yeah. what you had to say about that show that's another show where like i I watched two seasons of it and I, I find the found the writing to be so stale and, and off putting and dry. Well, after the first sort of, season they got rid of uh oh god, Darabont. he's such a yeah, yeah, Darabont, yeah. like who's like such a like next level show writer, like and, mm-hmm. and movie writer, like the Shawshank Redemption, right? Like, but they got rid of Darabont because he I think like he even said like he was just pissed off with the rest of the staff. They didn't let him do what he wanted. And like then they just got these like litany of writers, but the I guess my main critique of The Walking Dead was that you can't have a show that by definition has to go on forever. Like you just keep like next level boss leveling up sort of like a, like a fighting game, like Tekken or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it felt like, more like a vi- the yeah. progression, the dry progression of like a Mario Brothers, like. Yeah, like as soon as you get to a final boss. Season. Yeah. Turns but, out Peach was in the other castle. Got to go fight some more zombies. Yeah. But I you know. And- but, but no, I guess this, is my, this is my observation about it. And I mean, I think it, I forget when it first started, but I think it, I, I in my 2012, memory, I think, or 2011. Yeah, it was like something. predated the Great Awakening a bit. And so I did not have, when, when I was watching it, I did not have my my nightmare vision goggles on, or at least maybe a, not not the, the current prescription. But one thing that I found, that one of the uncanny elements of it was not necessarily explicit, overt, obvious, woke, talking points although maybe it got there eventually but you know it was this it was always out of out the gate this very multicultural multi ethnic yeah. cast yeah and yeah and and it was set <laughs> it's set in georgia and it had this like you know like 50 50 black white characters and yet everybody was written as this flat sort of um like at no point really there's one character who's a bad guy who dies early who's like who is racist but everybody else like the characters were so wooden there was no it's like race relations did not exist i don't think anybody ever even mentioned or brought up anybody's race and the pairings the couplings they did would just make no, I remember they had this one, like they they interjected this one love story with this one white character who's like the whitest guy. I wish I remember the name of the character. He's like a redhead with like this big hulking red ginger dude with. Oh, Abraham, up. Abraham. Yeah. He, yeah, the dude looks like a Civil War colonel. Like, yeah. like, like on the on the south, yeah. like, on the, you know, like he looked like he was a Confederate. He, yeah, looked, like, he looked like a Confederate <laughs> statue, and they like threw him into a, like, and suddenly he's just in love with like the this like young, much more kind of like cosmopolitan black female character, and it's just like accepted. And I mean, I think they did that a lot. Like the 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 lack of chemistry overall between any characters was just shocking and and I blame that at the yeah. level of the writing. But they well, even, they, like, they did not in any way that that show in no way shape or form attempted to write anything that could be recognized as just race relations in a post-apocalyptic America. There was and a like, little the, the bit most, like a- the most glaring yeah. aspect of it was that 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 absence. Like I was like, is there going to be tension? Is things going to evolve along racial lines? Like probably, you know, it's unfortunate, but human nature might happen in a you know zombie apocalyptic scenario. But it people just, it, people get more racist in the apocalypse. I feel like that's just yeah. the thing. Like, but to, I mean, your point yeah. that, that it sort of erases the past. Mm-hmm. You, you you had no sense of an American cultural history attached to any of the characters no it's totally a historical yeah it's like there is they don't even like i i don't even think they even say like that there were they lived in america like they you know a good example would be like the road right because the road by cormac mccarthy is very much a longing of the past that was the Walking Dead just accepts that they live in that the post apocalypse is actually post historical. That I know that's like 
galaxy YouTube millennial video essayist type of, you know, <laughs> content. But there was some race relations. I'll, I'll tell you what. There was Daryl and his brother Merle. Merle was like the evil chud redneck yeah. racist. Absolutely. And Daryl was, yeah. But the thing yeah, is, he's the, the only, were, but he's the only one that yeah. ever recognized you know, he used well, that's the, why they immediately the murdered him. <laughs> yeah, and they immediately yeah. murdered him. No, yeah. but also, Daryl learns to become anti racist, yes, and is also he's in redeemed, sort of, yes. yeah, is redeemed. And he's like, first, he's with uh, Carol, then he's with some deaf um, woman of color a little bit. Because the thing is, though, there was a little bit of that racial tension in the beginning, but you have to realize that Daryl Merle, their TV show inserts, they're not in the comics. And my theory is that Robert Kirkman, who I believe also had control over the show, at least at the beginning, uh, who wrote the comics, he's, of course, you know, a self-hating southern Southerner. He's a hicklib. Like, that's like the yeah, essence of, of hicklibery, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. So it's it's sort of like, um, well, well, Oren, where are you from the Mason-Dixon line? What's your uh, family history? Oh, I'm down in Florida here. I, I grew up in the Southeast, so. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so you know, because but you know the type, the hick lib, right? You probably experienced it. Oh yeah, of course, it. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, there's um, a, he, there's a there there's a I I I I went to community college, so I'm much better than everyone around me. Yeah. It's, it's... <laughs> no, but exactly right. Like me and Grace and Quay talk a little bit about this on the TL about the nature of the hick because in Canada we have the hick lib park salons. We have shows like Letterkenny, you know, which is like basically the hick lib show. You know, so it's like, but because, but that's what's such a subversive character is that, you know, you can take all of the Southern, like, or, or in Canadian case, like rural tropes and just totally like put them across that, you know, put them on its head where now it's Mahek and wholesome multiracial polycule farmstead. Like, did like, wasn't there like a, a vice documentary about like, a trans emu farm where the, all the, the emus farmers. Been, yeah. Yeah. They all eventually died though. The emus. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, it's like when, uh, your, uh, uh, your, uh, what was the, where they tried to make the autonomous commune out in, uh, during the summer of love. Uh, jazz, like, the chaz, yeah. The yeah. chaz. Yeah. You <laughs> yeah. know, they start planting yeah. things on top of like plastic bags because no one knows anything about farming. <laughs> so they like, create better. Yeah. yeah. Tur turns out communists have an excellent record of food production. So every everything oh. should be just fine. Um, yeah, they all read Hakeem Bay and they thought, yeah, we could do this. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, we're, we're getting over to that hour and a half. So we're going to go ahead and, wrap this one up oh we've got a, a few uh, super chats but before we get to those uh how about uh, let's start with geo can you tell everybody where to find you all your great work what should they look for sure um go to my channel right there jenna productions of course everyone knows me on twitter is at giant geo my telegram and my patreon are both the same um the content minded podcast just yesterday uh, i usually upload them on wednesdays but yesterday i uploaded a special early edition with my friend, hopefully everyone's friend, default friend, we talked about an internet writer called Humdog. It's a very good podcast, and you can find all the paywall content, the full versions of Content Minded, on my uh, Patreon and now Substack. So if you don't want to pay Patreon, then I understand. Then I, I'm trying to hit all the demographics because I feel like I'm leaving money on the table with like boomers and Gen Xers by on, on Substack, right? So, um, so all my archive is there, and of course every Thursday. I do the digital archipelago with uh, with Prudentialist. So we switch up. So last week was on my channel. This week's on his channel. And we're going to talk about the new Charles Haywood essay that he is in dialogue with uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Daniel Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about no enemies to the right. And uh, yeah. of course, we always cover like current happenings. Uh, and we mostly focus on culture because, you know, Prudy's a geopolitics guy. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's all my shilling. So, you know, give me money or a manual typewriter to quote Francis E. Dack. <laughs> so there you go. Excellent. Oh, also, yeah, I don't, like I have a lot of exciting guests on the way this week. I'm super busy. It's what I call the, uh, special content operation week. Number two, uh, tomorrow I'm both there and on man's world with Red Hawk and furious Pertinex. We're talking about mid girls and e girls. So there you and simping. So you can't miss that one. <laughs> Man, a geo spectacular to be sure. All right. Yeah. So uh last things. What do you got? Where should people check out your work? Oh wow, man. I, I don't know if I can follow up 
all of that. Um, yeah. Well, so, um, uh, last things four on on Twitter. I had to get rid of the other three uh, last things that preceded me. Mm-hmm. Um, you can just kind of Google last things on YouTube to find my my channel. Um, I've got a pretty good um, uh, backlog of content there, including some live streams with uh, with both of these gentlemen. Yeah. Um, or I think you're in a couple. Uh, and uh, next week I'm going to be uh, interviewing Raw Egg Nationalist. Actually, oh. having him on Wednesday night from um, from Tucker to last things, you know. I know, you know, you gotta like <laughs> the pipeline. Now he's now he's in yeah. the big time. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, you gotta have my, big, my interview baby with steps. him was great. He gave me a copy of his book. And uh, are you talking about the book uh, Eggs Benedict? Option, well, def- definitely, we'll touch on Eggs Benedict. There you option, go. Yeah. I just yeah. got both. I just got both Man- Man's World annuals in the mail today. Oh, oh yeah, I'm also in the yeah. new Man's World. That's yes. right. I have a uh, visual essay about the. That I certain that. era of the previous two years to not say on YouTube, but you know. my, uh, my, my wife, I left it unfortunately out on like the table and my wife found it and she was like, what the hell is this? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was cracking up reading it the whole day. So she knew someone was up. How can people pay you last things? How can they give you man? They can't, you know, I, I'm too, I'm too, I've been too lazy to like get a, get a Patreon going. I have like you have a, to get a your grift for, game, bro. Come on. I got, I got to get my grift game. I need like, I need to, a week of vacation where I can just settle down and really like get my, get my grift going. It'll You're leaving happen. money on the table. You're leaving I, feel, money I, on the t- I would feel obligated to ha- like make, make paywall content for for like you know i was gonna say then you'd have to make regular content which would be the 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 worst thing yeah that's the problem yeah Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. well no you you, last thing does it does amazing work but there could be large lapses in between them so you're 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 waiting for that uh for the next series you know so uh yeah he's the man has to have time to work you gotta let the art artist do his thing right exactly but as as oren mentioned i just finished a, a part a second uh video on the magicians uh my 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 videos tend to sort of p- pick some sort of movie or TV or, or media as a vessel for uh, exploring ideas or philosophers. Um, in the case of the magicians, um, I, I use them to talk about C.S. Lewis and um, right, right wing and versus left wing sci-fi and fantasy fiction. Um, I'll have another video out next week on the Sandman, um, which uh, we kind of dove into here a little bit. So that can be a bit of a teaser, but. But yeah, that's my that's my plug. Someday I'll have a subscribe star. Excellent. There you go. It's my dream to get to one day get kicked off of a Patreon for <laughs> be, be don't bold enough me. to yeah. yeah. That's my that's on my bucket list. Yeah. Maybe I should have went with uh subscribe star, but don't, but you know. Not yeah, that's where I, that's where I ended that. All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining me, gentlemen. Oh, we do have the, a super chat here. Let me get to that real quick. Uh, Creeper Weirdo here for $2. But it's better than the comic book. Um, <laughs> but it's better than the comic. Oh, is that a particular uh, <laughs> Is that a reference, reference to Walking reference? Dead or The Boys? I no, think I it think was, it was the, boys. the Boys. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that was a boys reference, but uh, but thank you very much, sir. Appreciate uh, your uh, your comment there. Uh, thanks everybody for coming by. It's been a great discussion. Of course, if this is your first time on the channel, I hope you go ahead and subscribe. And of course, if you are not listening to this as a podcast, you can now get it on a podcast wherever your finest podcasts are procured. It's on all the major platforms. If you do that, please make sure that you go ahead and give it a rating and a review. If you want to subscribe to the Substack, the Twitter, the Gab, if you want to watch this stuff on uh, on Odyssey or Rumble, of course, all those links are in the description. Also, I just had a uh, essay go up on uh, The Blaze that seemed to get a lot of good attention. So if you guys want to check that one out, it's about culture neutrality or the myth thereof. You can make sure to go ahead and read that as well. But thank you, everybody, for coming by. Thanks again to Gio. And last things, always great talking to these gentlemen. And as always, we'll talk to you next time.